So I, well, in preparation for the session, I went out um, online and, and looked up uh, how, how to do, how much information there was on this on the internet. And there's only two pages. And to find anything that only has two pages on the internet, I thought was pretty amazing. And a lot of those posts were mine. So this is a topic that's not very well documented. So hopefully, if you are trying to call a machine learning experiment in Data Factory, this will help you out, because there doesn't seem to be a lot of information out there. So what we're going to be covering today is kind of looking at an experiment very quickly so that we can um, get an idea of how that those run. Then take a look at um, Azure Data Factory, and then look at the author and deploy steps that are required. And then look at running a machine learning service, and then some tips on troubleshooting. So hopefully you find, hopefully you find that interesting. A little bit about me, my name is Ginger Grant, and I am on Twitter way too much at Desert Isle SQL. And that's a pretty good way to get a hold of me if after this you have any questions. Um, I also have a number of blog posts on this topic at um, Desert Isle SQLs. Um, you might want to give those a, a, a look because all the code that I'm talking today is already there. And I'm also a Microsoft MVP in data platform. So with all that, let's get started. So Azure Machine Learning, hopefully this is something that um, you've had a chance to take a look at. It's used for creating exper experiments. I put the standard definition out there, but one thing that um, Azure Machine Learning does is it provides a really good way to do very complex data analysis without a whole lot of um, experience. It's got a very great UI, allow, um, including a lot of the most complex algorithms commonly used in machine learning, and it's also very extensible. You can use um, R or Python and incorporate that within your machine learning experiment. As a matter of fact, a lot of companies are just creating, um, taking their existing R code and putting it into Azure ML and deploying that as a web service. It's a quick and uh, easy way to deploy a um, model that they've created in R. And one of the things that I think is, is um, the most compelling reason to use Azure Machine Learning is that everything else in Azure will cost you money. The free version of Azure ML is really good and it is really free. Not, oh, we're going to give you your credit card free, but you can do everything you want. Um, in Azure Machine Learning, and it's not going to cost you a dime. And for that reason, if for no other one, it's probably a reason that I think everybody should at least play around with it. So there are some really big differences in Azure ML when you're playing with it versus when you want it um, send it to production. The development environment, which we're going to be taking a look at, it's got a great user-friendly UI. Um, it is limited in the amount of data, though. I recently talked to a client, and they said, hey, we can't get this thing to work. And I'm like, how many records are you trying to put through it? And they said, half a million. I'm like, no, not going to work. Um, the re one of the reasons that the GUI is so intuitive and, and kind of punchy is because it's not meant to handle a lot of data. It's meant to test out your algorithms, and once you get everything working, then you really need to move to production to test it on a large quantity of data. Um, and it's all running in Azure. There is no on-premise solution for um, Azure ML. Microsoft is not planning on creating a um, on-box version or a local version of it. It's going to be remaining in the cloud. So in production, there's no UI whatsoever. And, but there's also no limits on processing any and all data that you might wish. You've got a couple gigs you want to run through, no problem. Um, you create it when your training is complete, so it's not used for testing um, models. It's used for, it's used for um, testing complete models rather than training and evaluating different algorithms. Um, and it can be run from a number of different places. You don't have to just run it from... Excel or a web service, you can run it from any application you wish. If you've got a custom application in-house, you can run your machine learning experiment and, and through there, so it's not really a problem. And also, you can run it through Data Factory, which is what we're going to be look, taking a look at today. So there's kind of a standard development process when you're look, talking about Azure ML. Um, when doing a machine learning experiment, your data's got to be very clean. If you've got missing or bad data, you're going to have to fix that before you're able to evaluate it. Um, you need to train your model. What that is a process of is looking at, um, at outcomes or trying to evaluate outcomes and determining 
and teaching the machine um, how to do this. There, there's a really famous example that, that was done in a Kaggle competition. Kaggle is a place where they do a lot of machine learning tests. And one of the tests that they did was to um, tell by a bunch of pictures which one was a cat and which one was a dog. And they did this by labeling the cat and dog pictures. And over time, with a number of samples, the computer learned the algorithms in the visual space for determining what was a cat and what was a dog. So once it knew that with all of the labeled pictures, the machine learning experiment was run just with unlabeled pictures, and it just had a 97% um, accuracy rating, which is really pretty good because actually humans are a little bit lower than that at 96. So it's a, a, a way of training a computer to do the recall um, methods that it's very good at. So once you have a model trained, you, that's when you're going to be wanting to create your web service. And once you have your web service, then you want to deploy it. Um, one of the things about this graphic is, is what's kind of interesting about machine learning experiments is they're generally speaking not done because the world we live in changes. So sometimes your analysis is very accurate, but things change that would, might want you to change your model in the future. So it's something you always want to take, it, you know, take into consideration. So let's actually take a look at now Azure ML. All right, well this is the Azure ML environment. Um, this, I got to this by going to studio at azureml.net and logging in. And I've got a number of options here on the left. And I'm going to be reviewing the experiment I did on census data. So let's take a look at that. And because I'm paranoid and don't want anything bad to happen to my experiment, I'm just going to do a save as and um, give this a different number so I know that my demo later on will still work. All right. So what I'm going to do with this is, actually, I wanted to do both of them. Let me go back to this. I've got two experiments here. I've got the predictive experiment. And I've got the actual experiment. And I wanted to go into the actual experiment. I ended up opening up the predictive one. So I'm going to do this one instead. And I'm just going to call this one 5. All right. So let me blow this up a little bit so we can actually see it. Nice thing, I don't need to zoom in. I can just do it from within here. And you'll see that what I've got is I've got some data in a CSV. I don't have, if we take a look at the little dots here, we can visualize the data, and we can see that I've got um, a lot of census data here from 1994, and it's got um, some various uh, descriptions of, of uh, people, and then it will tell me whether or not somebody is making more than less than $50,000. So based on these criteria that are listed here, I should be able to tell whether or not how much money somebody makes. But you'll also notice that this particular data doesn't have any headers, which is why I have a data set over here, which just contains the header information. And I'm going to want to put those two together. With Azure ML, I also have the ability to run SQL statements. So you can see what I'm doing is just doing a union so I get my header information on here. So after that, I'm going to um, create a, a label for one of my fields. What that is about is if I take a look at, uh, oops, if I take a look at my data here, what I want to do is I want to be able to predict this column when I don't have it so that I will be able to look at, any, at the, the same criteria and not know how much somebody makes and be able to determine it. This particular column is called wage, and that's the one that I want to analyze, so I'm creating that as a cate as, as categorical label, because this is what I'm going to evaluate. And then what I'm doing here is I'm excluding two columns that don't tell me very much, and those two columns are funnel weight and education. This doesn't mean anything to me, because I have this information somewhere else, and the education name here is duplicated in the number. So I'm just going to use a number. So I'm effectively going to get rid of these two columns because I don't need them. The other thing that you'll notice that I'm doing here is I am setting, setting various values to integer. 
Um, while this may seem to be kind of a silly thing to do, I'll explain why this is a very important step when um, cast, to cast your variables as integer if they are integer. The next thing that this particular experiment does is this is a training experiment. So it trains the data and it splits the data from to determine and what it would be like without the um, the algorithm applied, and then I'm applying the two class average Perceptricon um, algorithm to determine to train my data to determine um, what conditions make somebody make more or less than fifty thousand dollars. And what this particular um, component does is looks at how which it, at the relative weights of all of my variables. So let's go ahead and run this. And one thing that this is often compared to is SSIS because you'll notice you get green checks. So I've got lots of green checks, which is always good, and I'm done. So if we go ahead and visualize the results here, we'll notice that we've got a big um, area um, above this line here, and this is called area under the rock, which tells us that we are really pretty good at determining with that algorithm whether or not somebody makes $50,000 or more. And we can look at our confusion matrix, which is um, right here, to see that um, how we're scoring in, in our, um, both in percentage and in actual numbers, um, our success rate for guessing how much somebody makes. And also, if we look at the permutation feature of importance here, we can see that if you're looking at what's the most important criteria to determine how much money somebody makes, the most important criteria is education, then marital status, then occupation. And way down at the bottom is race, which is somewhat interesting. All right, so I have a working experiment, which is exactly what I'm gonna need to do, because what I'm gonna wanna do now, since it works, is I wanna create a um, web service for it. One thing that if you look at this online, you'll notice that this particular process has changed quite a bit over time. So sometimes I caution you when you look at stuff to take it with a grain of salt because it may not work the same way now as it did whenever that last video was made. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this button that says predictive web service. And it is going to create a web service. Notice that it changes some things for me and it creates a web service output and web service input. This is not where I want to have my input though because I want to make sure that I have it um, closer to where my data is. And My data is not going to be looking like this because I actually was able to get it fixed that has header information. So I don't need the SQL transformation. I also don't need the, the wage column so I'm going to go ahead and eliminate that. And what I'm going to want to do is take wage out of the selected columns because my new data set won't have that. And I'm going to want to put it here to exclude these two column names. And then I'm going to want to edit my, my metadata so that I'm um, casting these. Now, the reason I actually wanted to cast these is this is something that is uh, not documented that you may run into. Unfortunately, I did. Um, many times when you're running a machine learning uh, experiment, it's much more picky about the data types and does not handle them the same way it does when it, you're running an experiment within the UI or even within the web service itself. And this is also almost impossible to detect. More about that later. But this is where I want it to, this is how I want the web service to be. So I'm going to go ahead and run this because I changed it. It's going to make me run it or to be able to deploy it. And when I do that, you'll notice that it's virtually the same. And if we look at our training experiment, you'll notice the differences are, were not duplicated here. So this is what it looks like when we've trained it. Notice no more training is required because we have determined that the, our model is successful. So what we're doing is we're putting our, the logic of it here we're, and we're providing the scores. And when we do that, when we go, when we look at the data, we notice that I've got two columns that I didn't have previously, and those columns were scored labels and scored probabilities. 
And this value here says what's the probability of somebody's making um, more than 50K and, and then it's putting the labels next to it. So greater than 50K here, you'll notice that this person is 40, a husband, and he's got 13 years of education. And so this kind of looks at the criteria that when we're looking at for what the most valuable criteria are to make money and this guy hits them all. So this is what our probabilities are and this is going to be the output of their machine learning experiment. It'll be all of these variables plus the label and scored probabilities. Okay, so this is our web service and this is what we're going to want to deploy. So if we want to deploy it, we just click on the button that says deploy web service. And we can go ahead and test it. I'm going to go ahead and test it in Excel. And I want to do it if for uh, batch execution because I think it makes a pretty good test. This is also another feature that has changed a lot in machine learning. So if you have seen this uh, a couple of months ago and it didn't look like this, surprise, it looks different. So it's going to tell me that it's going to um, create some sample data and I'm fine with that. And I want to open it with Excel. And Excel's beeping at me and saying, are you really sure you want to do this? And I'm going to say, yes, I do. And notice I get this machine learning window up here. And I want to, it's telling me that it has, that it knows that I want to run my experiment. And I want to add my web service. Whoops. And oh, um, I'm going to um, tell it to use sample data. And let's just put the sample data here. So, sure, A1 sounds great use sample data. So it's created some sample data for me that it is made up and then I'm going to go ahead and tell it to do some output for me to run my experiment right here. And let's see, this is sheet 1A9. And I'm going to go ahead and tell it to predict. Yes, and it gave me an error. Oh, because I wanted to do a whole bunch more columns that I had to let it to do. Well, let's make it, let's see if I can just get it to do it that way. Well, let's try this. See if I can get it to come up over here. Huh. Well, I don't understand that because I'll, I'll click on auto predict and see if I can get it to happen. That's great because this worked like uh, just a few minutes ago, but there you go. So, what this sh should be doing, and I don't know why it's not, let me go ahead and try this again. And let's just do this quick test here because I do want to show you that it's working. I'm just going to be lazy and make me actually enter data, but I'm good with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just enter some sample data here. And this is a value that I don't care about, but um, it is in my data set, so I have to fill it in. But, but this is something that I excluded later on. And I'm just going ahead and entering all my values here. Because it wouldn't work in Excel for some reason. Oops, that wouldn't be right. And I'm going to go ahead and test it here. Notice it's testing it down here. And it's telling me 
that the probability that somebody is making greater than $50,000 with these conditions is 93%. So you can see that we can see that it is working, which is a good thing. All right, so we know that we have a working model. We were able to test it, which is definitely something you want to do when you're working with, um, Azure, with Azure ML and with Data Factory. So, okay. All right. Going back to our slides here. So let's talk a little bit about Data Factory. There is a big misconception that Data Factory is SSIS in the cloud. This cannot be further from the truth. Um, you, if you want to do any, any ETL, and I'm talking about data types, or maybe push two columns together, you better, write, you better be good at C Sharp, because that's, that's what is going to be required to be able to do that. Um, that's also a problem if you get a lot of dirty data, because cleaning it up in Data Factory, while it's possible, is quite a, quite a programming chore. There's no controls that are available to make that happen. It's not an ETL environment at all. It's what, what um, data, data Factory is also not terribly easy to troubleshoot. You, you pretty much is a black box. It runs until it gives you an error, which may or may not be helpful, and there's no stepping through it whatsoever. So what Data Factory is, is it's similar to a SQL job. And by that, I mean you have a series of steps. It's on a timer. People may be notified. It's, it's running with a specific ID. And there are various steps in it. That's what it's really like, more like a SQL job, not like SSIS. And it can, you know, it can run various things. It's primarily designed to move data around and run services in the middle. It is JSON intensive. You will be writing a lot of JSON if you write Data Factory. And it's good at moving things around and, and calling processes. So, a lot of JSON required. You got to write JSON to get the data. You got to write JSON to send the data to the blob storage. Write JSON to call the experiment. And write JSON to send the results of a data source, which is a lot of JSON. Kind of like this picture, because I've seen this JSON and there's a lot less of them recently. And also, every time you say it, I always think JSON. Uh, Jason, because I happen to know like, I don't know, 10 or 11 guys named Jason, so it's always confusing. So in Data Factory, what you'll need to do is, is work a lot with the author and deploy step. You'll need to create a link service for each data source, because everything requires a link service. Um, you need one for the web service, and then you need to define your data sets, and then define your various pipelines to put it all together. So these are the steps that are required in order to run a um, Azure machine learning job. And it's a lot easier to show you than to talk about it. So let's go ahead and load up Data Factory and get this running. All right. So Data Factory runs in Azure, and it does cost money, unlike machine learning. Um, it's based on how much data you move around and where you move it to which determines a cost because you can't talk about Azure ML if you're not, or excuse me, anything in Azure without talking about cost. You, what you want to make sure that you do is do not, it's kind of like Ghostbusters, don't cross the streams, do not cross the uh, locations. I'm doing everything in the West um, because that's near where I live. Whatever you do, if you move from data center to data center, there's a lot bigger um, charge. There's also a charge that is greater to push data in than to access the data there, so you're better off if the data um, starts and stays in Azure. And so for that reason, I'm using um, an, an Azure DB database to store my data. So let's take a look at um, Data Factory here. And I'll show you the various components. I'll show you why this error is not, is, it, it shows it zero errors, but it still shows it's there, which I find really annoying, especially for demo. But the main step here, is author and deploy. Um, I've had limited success with this copy data preview. Sometimes it'll work like I want to and sometimes it won't. Monitor and manage limit, um, can help diagnosings once they're running. Sample pipelines, again, the samples can be useful, but generally speaking, I just write my own. The diagram's kind of nice. We'll go ahead and click on that. And in this diagram, you'll see all of the steps that are we are going to be creating in our um, 
data factory job that's going to run our um, Azure ML experiment. And you can see I've got a data set, database data set here. I'm copying that to a blob. The only way, unfortunately, to run a web service is through a blob. I can't run it directly from a database as much as I tried. Um, by the way, that uh, is documented in some very small places. Trust me, though, it, you'll just be beating your head against the wall if you try doing this without first copying it to a blob. That is required. Um, once you run your, um, have it moved to blob, then you can run your machine learning experiment, which is what this pipeline ML step does. And then it just puts the data to a blob for output, but I don't want my data in a blob. I want it back in the database, so I'm going to copy it out, which is what this last step does. So let's take a look at the code that is required to write that, which is, of course, lots of JSON. All right, so these are the various steps that are required to do that. I don't have any data gateways because all my data is in the cloud, so I don't need to move. So this is one thing that I don't have. So the first thing that I'm going to have to have is I need to have link service input. So this is the definition of my blob storage. The hub name is, is really kind of silly because it's, it's, if you look around, you'll notice that there isn't one. This is the name of your data factory with underscore hub after it. So you don't get to name it, then this hub just belongs to that. So um, if just name it whatever your name of your data factory is, underscore hub. And t you'll tell it what kind of data storage it is. And you do need the actual real account key. And as soon as you deploy it, it changes as into little stars. Obviously, my account key is not little stars, because if it was, it wouldn't work. But it does translate that as soon as I say deploy. Deploy is what is um, what is called save in this environment. You cannot change the name of anything either if you try. It'll tell me that it can't deploy because I can't change the name. And if I want to do that, I need to clone it. So hopefully you like the name because if you um, want to change it, you got to clone it and then save it and then delete that, which is seemingly annoying, but that's how it works. So I have input, which is my um, blob storage, and output, which I'm doing to another blob storage location. Um, and it's the same thing. I'm just putting it to a different... Um, directory. Let's take just take a look at that. So where I'm putting my blob storage to is I have an input. I have an input and output containers on this ML blob storage account. So this is where my data is going to be um, coming into and going out of. Right back to Data Factory. So I'm creating the link services that give it the important information that it needs. Here I'm telling it the database, the Azure database that I am going to be connecting to. And again, um, this is just the database. I have to create a server for this. And this is the name of my database. And my output is also to the same database, uh, to a different table. But I have to define the, I define the output separately just because I think that makes it cleaner. And then what this is, is this is the link service to my uh, Azure ML endpoint. And the most important thing to remember about this is, is, let me show you how I got it. So if we look at the experiment, like when we just created, and if we go to configuration, oops, sorry, it's not configuration, it is... That execution. So here is where the request URL is. Notice it says jobs at the end of it, whatever it will say, it'll say jobs API version 2.0. This needs to go away. It needs to stop where it says jobs or it won't work. And you'll get a very meaningless error message that's no fun to try to figure out what that means. So that is where this endpoint comes from. And the API key is this. So this is my API key, and this is what I paste in here. And then again, it translates it into little stars. OK, so once we have the definitions, then we have the actual data sets. And this is the folder path and the name of the file that it's going to be going to. And that's for my blob 
data set and this that's um, from the database to the blob. This is my output, which is why I call it ML output. Notice I am I use my link storage name here, and this code is somewhat smart. You can't go create um, referencing link service names that don't exist. If you do, it won't give you an error until you can't save it. So you do have to create your link services. So you can call your link services when you do your data sets. The availability, this is how frequently it's going to run. Now, I didn't need to make this say frequency one day. Um, as a matter of fact, the way this runs is actually kind of odd, but I went ahead and did that. So this will run every day. It's considered inter internal, so it's external equals false, and the policy is left as blank. And that's very similar to what the input data set has as well. Now this is for my database. This is an actual copy of the file. Let's take a look at the database here for a second too. So I'm going to go back here. And this is the name of my SQL Azure database. Now if we take a look at it, the most important thing to remember with this is you need to make sure that you set your server firewall settings. This is where um, the IP address right now for where I live, and if I do not set this, I cannot connect to my own data to my own database, which is highly annoying. And to connect to the database, the easiest thing in the world is just to click on this tools button and open it in Visual Studio. Yes, I can open this in Management Studio but I generally just open it in Visual Studio because it wants to and then I don't have to worry about it. And what it's going to make me do is it's going to make me enter my password. Notice it has a database name and the server name there for me. And I did have to configure this when I initially configured my database. And it's busy loading now. Right, and you can see it's set up for our. Oh, let's take a look at this database, and it's just got a few tables in it. All right, so this is the this is my source, and I'm just going to. Let me give you a tip when you're creating databases in Azure. If you select ones that are slow and pokey, they are cheaper, which is why I tend to do that so that um, this is kind of slow from a database perspective, but it's also cheap. And that matters when I have limited months of Azure spend. So in the interest of making sure that my demo worked, I only am running four rows. Obviously, I've run um, half a terabyte through uh, for a particular client, but I wanted to make sure that I don't have anything it's going to blow up, so I limited my data sets here. The demo guts may not always be smiling on me. And this is where we're going to be sending it. And there's nothing there. So this data is um, not exactly the same as you'll notice if you look at the column names. I'm taking out these two columns I didn't care about, and I've got scored labels and scored probabilities here on the end. So this is going to be the destination that the data goes to in part of our machine learning experiment. Okay. So, back to Data Factory. So I've got my data sets defined with all the columns that I have. This is my input, so I've got these two columns. And you'll notice in my output, I don't have these columns. And I also have scored labels and scored probabilities. By the way, this is case sensitive. SQL Server isn't case sensitive, but this is. So if I so much as capitalize this, I'll get an error. Which I'm not going to do because I don't like errors. But make sure that you have this exactly the same way you've got it defined in SQL Server or you will have problems. So that is why it's defined this way. And I also have to make sure that my table name is configured exactly, you know, with exact capitalization that is required as well for the same reason. So this is, a, this is my table name for my output, and this is the link service name that uses it. 
Um, it is, it's not smart enough to know whether or not this table exists. It'll just error out when it runs. So that's actually what happened when I created my data set originally. When I created this particular data set, the table didn't have a different name. And it, it kept it, now it, it says error zero, but that's why I have a with error there. Now you'll notice here that it tells me that it's ready and it tells me when it last ran, sort of, because this particular um, slice is showing um, UDT time, which is not my time, UTC time, so it's, it, this doesn't necessarily correlate. You have to figure out how this correlates to your time zone. And this is also set to run on the schedule but I don't want to run it on a schedule. I want to run right now because I'm that patient. So let's actually take a look at the overall diagram and figure out what we want to run first. So what I want to do is I want to run my, um, my data set to blob first. So let's go ahead and do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my data set and I'm going to look at the blob data set here and I notice It'll tell me down here if I have had it failed recently. And it tells me that it's, going to be, that it's going to be scheduled to be running later today. But I don't want to run it later today. I want to run it right now. So what I will do here is I just can go ahead and highlight one of them. Actually, I can just do the one that's pending execution. And I can tell it that I want this to run now. Um, I realize this is seemingly a relatively easy step, but good luck finding documentation on this. So I want this to run right now so that I can see if I have data. So I'm going to go ahead and tell it to run. And you'll notice here it says pending execution. And we can see what time it thinks it is, and it thinks it is 6.41.51 p.m. And this shouldn't take very long to run. Just hit F5 so I could watch it paint again. See it actually running. And we'll go back. Well, data set. So it says pending, pending validation. And run. Come on. This is always a problem when you do this in Azure. I'm also not patient at all, so I'm going to hit this again as well. Now it tells me it's in progress. All right. So this is in progress. Hopefully I will get... An update for this it tells me that it's running. And the last time it did take 61 seconds, which is why I always limited this to four rows. Still running. Probably wait to punch out of this since it's at 61 minutes, uh, 44. Do this one more time. Succeeded. Yeah, exactly the same time as last time. All right, so while we can tell that it it's succeeded, so you just don't have to take my word for it, is what I need to do here is go to my blob storage count, input, and you'll notice I have a file that just was created. All right, so that's, that's working just fine. So the next step, of course, is to run the, um, since I have it to blob, I want to run my ML experiment. Are there any questions yet so far while I'm going through this, Jason? Nope, no questions so far. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to want to, if we look back at our diagram, next thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I run this pipeline ML. I've got a blob data set, so I'm going to run the output. To do that, 
Again, if I was oh, I had this whole thing scheduled, I could actually wait for it, but uh, I'm just way too lazy to do that. I want it to run right now. So I'm going to go ahead and tell this to run. Last time it ran was at 20, ran for 25 seconds. There we go. Now it says it's running. And when it is done running, I'm going to figure that it's going to be very relatively quickly. What it's going to do is it's going to put the results in blob storage as output. And you can see here it just finished because I've got it at 145.29, so we have some data here, so if we take a look at it, we can actually download it, and we're just going to open it up with Excel just to take a look at what it looks like, and we see that we've got our data that it ran, our machine learning experiment, and it ran, uh, looked at the four tables that were out there in our database, and it said that the chances that these people were going to be making a lot of money aren't, aren't terribly good. They're not the chances of making fifty thousand dollars. All these four people not probably not going to happen, given how low the probability is. So I'm not going to go ahead and save. And then the last step in our pipeline here oops, is we want to copy this back to the database. So I want to run the data set output because I don't want this to hang out in blob storage. I actually want it in, in my database. So if I do that, I go here, tell it that I want to run right now. And make sure that this is, yep. And this is pen execution. Oh, it tells me that's running. Great. And so when it runs, I will have data in my database, and I'm pretty sure that that's what's going to happen. And in the interest of time, let me tell you that the key thing to remember is with this, I don't have any ability to see anything other than I get an error at the end. That's not terribly intuitive. As a matter of fact, if you get an error in this process, there's nothing that you can really do besides go back to your machine learning experiment and tweak it to see why it's not working. Um, same thing with um, any of the steps in between. The only thing that it does catch is if you are have different linked names in your database, any capitalization errors that you make in your JSON, any definition errors, yeah, you'll just get errors and um, relatively generic ones, and you may or may not be able to find them, um, which makes troubleshooting this an absolute nightmare. Um, because if you do run into any problems, the issue is, is the errors that you have may or may not in, um, lead you to an area in which you are able to determine what the error is and the steps that it takes to fix it. And putting together another machine learning experiment, which is what you have to do anytime you make a change to the model, is relatively intensive um, in terms of a, a time effort involved. So it's it's kind of a, a can be sort of a, a problem if that's the case. So going back to database here that we looked at before, if I run my output, I see I've got the four rows here and I've got the probabilities. So this was a completely successful machine learning experiment. And all of the code to run this I've got on my website already so that you have the ability to do this whenever you want to do it. So some tips, though, if, you're, if you are doing this, though, wanted to go back to the slides, is there are 999 errors defined in Data Factory, which means that if you don't have the, any one of the 999 errors that are listed, you will get error 1,000. So you you can get error 1000 for like, oh, I think I counted seven different things, and it doesn't really matter. It's all undefined, error 1000, so sorry. We don't have that one defined. 
Um, one of the things that's not defined is the fact that the machine um, learning experiment input wants you to type everything that's not a string. I don't know where you'll find any documentation on this other than on my website because uh, it's not something that was documented. When I talked to Microsoft about it, they, they told me that they were interested in expanding the number of errors listed to something greater than 999, but I do not know if that's happened. So that's the big problem is when you're running it, you may get 999 for an, you may get 1,000 for an error because that's the, you have an undefined error. And most of the time I had errors, I found that was the case. Um, debugging tools. There aren't any. You hope it runs. If it if it breaks somewhere in the middle, you have no idea where, no idea how. Um, it's just going to give you an error at the end. And if you have a lot of data and it takes you 30, 40 minutes to run, that's a real picnic. Um, there are some steps for debugging in Azure ML. Make sure that you test it very well. Make sure you put a number of batches through in Excel so that you can find any and all errors that way. Um, one of my problems was with my test data. I had a smaller sample set, and my larger set had errors, but I didn't know that, and I didn't didn't find that um, necessarily until my job blew up, and I couldn't figure out why it blew up because I had error 1,000. So something to keep in mind if you are um, working with this and you're getting errors, there is they can be quite difficult to troubleshoot. As a matter of fact, I had to call Uncle and, and, and talk to Microsoft to get some help in figuring out how to fix my error. So a word to the wise. Um, I understand they're working on the process to fix it, but it is how it is right now. So as a summary, I showed you a little bit about writing in a machine learning experiment. We created a web service and looked at what it takes to run a web service in Data Factory, and then I talked you through some of the troubleshooting issues that you might run into so that you could resolve them on your own time. With that, I want to um, thank you very much um, for attending, and if you have any questions, I'm happy, hence, happy to answer them, and I do have, like I said, all of this documented on my site, and that's the link for it. All right. We don't have any questions at the moment, but I'm going to see if saying that actually changes the fact that we have any questions, because it usually does. Sometimes it doesn't. It, one thing that I will... Oh, yeah. sure. Go ahead. Um, one thing that I will say is that, you know, um, this is going to be something that you're going to run into when you're just doing more than just playing around with um, machine learning um, experiments. but. I did everything with the free version, so I could even run data through the free version. I do have a limits of 10 gig, but that's generally nothing that I've run into in my testing. So just kind of keep that in mind. But you, again, everything I did, I did with the free version. So awesome. Well, thank you today, Ginger. Uh, we will just wrap up the session here then, and um, uh, thank you everyone for attending, and thanks, Ginger, for the session. This is some great, great stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Bye-bye.